Okay, I think we got it all figured out here. Welcome everybody to uh, Brown Bag History for November 18th. Today's topic is automobiles and roads. As we start, we'll just acknowledge that uh, we are on the, the uh, lands uh, that are uh, used and sacred to the Sequipmec, the Tanaha, the Sinaixt, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. And we acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and cultures. So uh, today we're talking about automobiles and roads and uh, without me going into tons of extra research and sort of basing it on sort of what we already had had gathered, some of the history of the early cars and some of the early roads here, but it's definitely not a comprehensive history. Um, this is probably one of the earliest photographs that we have showing a vehicle. This is uh, July 13th, 1908, uh, Orangeman Day Parade. And you can see that there's a motorized vehicle, at least one at the beginning of the parade. Um, we know that uh, the first vehicle that came to Revelstoke was in 1907, so just a year before this. A man named uh, H. Cunningham Morris was the editor of the Revelstoke Mail Herald, and he brought a car to town. The Mail Herald of February 20th, 1907, says the first automobile that will ever chug in Revelstoke was landed here today and will be put into commission by the editor shortly. The auto is one of the Oldsmobile pattern of American manufacture, the Olds having a worldwide reputation. The machine is a two-seater of seven and a half horsepower. And it mentioned uh, a year later in June of 1908 that uh, he and another uh, man also with the name Morris, possibly a brother, were the first to drive an auto automobile through the canyon as far as the steamboat landing at Five Mile. The found in a later article about H. Cunningham Morris uh, when he made a little bit of a name for himself in the United States and they wrote an article about uh, about his life and uh, talked about his car, which was described as a little green roadster. And uh, the newspaper said, um, his automobile caused one major excitement in 1912 when it crashed into the Revelstoke Independent Band as it marched along Third Street in front of Central School. The band came off second best in the encounter. Men and instruments being scattered hither and yon. One irate bandsman picked up the huge bass horn and threw it at Morris. It cost Morris $250 in repair bills, both to the band instruments and to his car, but no member of the band was uh, seriously injured. So, uh, some of the other early vehicles, and I don't know makes or, or years of these. Uh, if anybody does know that, let me know and we can add that to our, uh, our uh, information later. This is a man named Jay Smith who had a car full of uh, kids and near the Columbia River Canyon around 1910. You can see that it's a right-hand drive. And uh, you can see that there's, of course, no such thing as seat belts back then. And uh, another car uh, from the McRae family. And uh, probably also around 1910, 1912, I'm guessing. Uh, but again, if anybody has further information, I'd be happy to hear that. Um, the McRae family lived on, uh, on Third Street West. And this is, uh, there, were, there was a McRae family and there was a McRae family. And it took me a few years working to them in the museum to figure them out. This was Alex McRae. There was also an Alex McRae, C-R-A-E. Uh, but this McRae, uh, he was quite involved in uh, mining and lumber uh, and uh, was also quite involved in the city as well in, in the early days. He was involved in the Mundy Lumber Company. And in fact, the young child who is at the wheel of the car was uh, Mundy McRae named after A.S. Mundy, who, or S.A. Mundy, who started the Mundy Sawmill at Three Valley. Uh, there's also a note in the newspaper in uh, August of 1908 saying that Mrs. Emma Turnross had purchased a McLaughlin Buick a touring automobile from E.A. Bradley, 
which they will be using in connection with their livery business. And uh, I'm not sure if it's the exact same vehicle, but this there's a, a motorized vehicle right there. And uh, we were given the information that all of the, the carts and the, the uh, car in this photograph were owned by the uh, Turnross family. They had a livery company and uh, the, I understand the photographer had them uh, bring their carts onto the street so that it would to enhance this photograph. That it's a you know, busy, busy street with all of this vehicle traffic on it. Uh, so that whether that's the McLaughlin Buick or not, I'm not sure, but it was owned by the uh, the Turnross family, and they had a livery uh, business across the the tracks a little bit uh, to the, I think it's sort of across from the track across the tracks from uh, where the old hospital was or where the Alpine Village Mall is now. Um, so you know it in the early days, whenever anybody brought a car to town, it was big news. And of course, the only way to get a car into town at that time was by having it shipped in by train because there were no roads from the outside. Uh, here's an article from uh, or an ad from a 1922 newspaper. Uh, Haggett and Reed were the proprietors of the Acme Motor Company, and they were selling uh, Ford automobiles. Um, and you can see they've got a, a Ford chassis, 600 and $54, a runabout, $728, a touring car, $772. So um, even you know, for those days, they're fairly high prices for a vehicle. The, they were located in the Orange Hall, which is what, next to the telephone company office. And that's the brick building just down the street from us on 2nd Street West that's uh, just recently taken over by the Community Connections was uh, formerly known as, before that, for years, it was the uh, the cable office. Um, that was the, the Orange Hall. So that's where they were located. Um, so whenever you get cars, you're gonna get car accidents. So um, I'm not sure exactly what happened here. We don't have any information about that photograph, but it's a uh, 1922 license plate. And you can see that it's a left-hand drive. And that's the year that's that's the year that BC became standardized left-hand drive. Before that, it was kind of you know, back and forth. But um, yeah, that's happened somewhere in the area, but I don't know exactly where where that accident happened. The photograph of uh, Len Housen, whose uh, family owned the uh, uh, furniture um, store and the funeral parlor that later became Brandon's. And uh, his father owned what was um, recently known as Minto Manor, uh, formerly known as Birch Lodge, the house at the end of, uh, near the end of Mackenzie Avenue. And the one right at the end the, uh, the, was built for Len and his wife in uh, 1912, 1913, when he got married. So this was uh, his vehicle. And uh, Joe and Sarah Farmelo on Mount Revelstoke in the 1930s Joe uh, came over from England. He had, uh, when he was in England, he was um, a professional jockey, but he also worked as a chauffeur in England. And he did a lot of driving when he came to Revelstoke as well. He um, was, we've got a picture of him driving a horse and cart for the King Edward Hotel. And he drove some of the, the, the local ambulances and uh, other uh, commercial vehicles in town as well. This one would have been taken on Mount Revelstoke. Yeah, you can tell it's high up because of the, the trees. Yeah. Um, I put it 1930s, uh, if, if we can date it, um, you know, different date uh, than that. I put it as 1930s because the highway to the summit was completed in 1927. People were driving on the road before that uh, to as, as far as, as it was open. But with, when you're seeing the trees that are obviously at the summit, I'm guessing that this was taken after the road was completed to the summit. So uh, Frank McCarty, who was uh, Revelstoke's uh, first mayor, had uh, originally had a butcher store here and a ranch here where he was supplying meat. But he later went into the uh, livery business and then garage business, and he was, uh, was selling cars. So this was a Studebaker that he 
uh, brought uh, to Revelstoke or had brought to Revelstoke by a man named Dan Leary in uh, 1916. Uh, this was the Revelstoke garage that was started by uh, McCarty. And uh, this is the location where the Cheers Beer and Wine store is now. Uh, the side of it where you can, uh, the side there would be Victoria Avenue side and this is Orton Avenue here. And if, this, if that is 1930s, that would be after uh, McCarty died. So uh, he died in 1920s, so it would have uh, changed hands by then. And there's another picture showing the front of the, uh, the garage. And uh, the, you can see the, the gas pumps there. Okay, Revelstoke Tire started uh, just uh, on this end? Okay. Okay, so I'm just uh, getting information from my audience. So Snow White Laundry was later in this end and Revelstoke Tire started in this uh, end of the building. 1958 is when Revelstoke Tire started. I've got some very smart people in my audience here. <laughs> um, I have, based on um, feedback from before, I'm making sure that I repeat the information that I'm getting from my audience because uh, people who are watching this on Zoom and Facebook can't hear uh, what I'm, uh, what my audience is, is adding. Um, this is uh, Frank McCarty's car being towed to storage for the winter, about 1919. This is Nemo Roberts' uh, photo uh, because you know, they didn't really plow the streets. They had horse-drawn uh, plows that they would kind of plow the streets, but they really uh, would just plow them enough really for you know horse-drawn vehicles and pedestrian traffic to get through. It uh, wasn't really that great for a, a vehicle to drive in the winter. So most people just uh, had their cars parked or put into storage for the, for the winter. Now that I didn't know this, so this building. So I've just been informed that uh, there was probably vehicle storage in the upper floor of this building. There would have been a ramp in there to move uh, vehicles up. So that's something I didn't know. That's, I wasn't sure where all these vehicles were being stored for the winter. So this is the, uh, the first uh, traffic bridge across the Columbia River at Revelstoke. It was completed in 1910. It was a wooden bridge and it was located one block south of where the Big Eddy Bridge is now. So that opened in 1910. Before that, there was no uh, foot traffic or um, you know, horse traffic across the bridge. It was either you had to cross uh, by boat or uh, across the railway bridge. And I've heard a few horror stories or uh, of scary stories about people crossing the railway bridge uh, or um, in the winter, sometimes you could cross on the ice if the ice was thick enough. But uh, so that was a, a big day in Revelstoke. There was one woman who lived in the Big Eddy, and it was Mrs. Griffith. And uh, she'd had one experience where she and her husband had carried children across the railway bridge when they wanted to come into town to listen to a, a concert. And um, she was so terrified that when she got back, to the Big Eddy, she said she wasn't um, coming across until there was a bridge built. And I think that was about two years before she came back into, into Revelstoke. So uh, she, for one, would have been very happy when this uh, bridge was built. And then in uh, 1924, the Big Eddy Bridge was built. So our, uh, our old Big Eddy Bridge is getting quite old. Uh, we'll be celebrating its 100th anniversary in four years if it makes it that long. So, um, and there was, a, um, you know, so it was, yeah, that was a big deal when they uh, built the, the uh, Iron Bridge. And uh, of course that was, uh, by this time, there was a road built uh, west of here, uh, linking Revelstoke to Sycamus. This is um, called Moran's Hill, it is now, 
uh, close to where Airport Way is. Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same uh, grade as the as Airport Way now, but it's in that location. Uh, it was called Moran's Hill because there was uh, the Moran family had a farm at the the base of uh, of the hill, um, close to further close to where Illisola Road is now in that area. And this was the Loop Road, uh, so there was uh, the the, air, the airport way or Moran's Hill, but there was also a lower road that uh, went down the, where the um, the South Railway. So the the railway crossing that they've just covered over when they put in the roundabout, uh, that crossing was part of the um, Arrowhead uh, branch line, and uh, it went down on this side of the river all the way to Arrowhead. Uh, but there was also a loop road that um, that went there, um, went south as well. Um, well. I think I have my photographs a little bit out of order here. Uh, I'll I'll get back to that one. But I do have a photograph showing the uh, the bridges that were across the Old Silhouette too. So um, in 1920, there was uh, quite a bit of information in the newspapers about automobiles. People were definitely becoming more interested in in owning cars in town. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, really encouraging the road building in the area. Uh, there was a note in February of 1920 uh, saying that six gray Dort automobiles arrived in town and were taken to the garage of W.A.P. Connolly and G.W. Bell. Uh, so the company had uh, just engaged a first-class mechanic. Uh, gray Dort was a Canadian automobile factory manufacturer in Chatham, Ontario, and they were building cars between 1915 and 1925. In um, March of 1920, it was announced that uh, Dr. Sutherland, who was a local doctor and was also a member of, of uh, the legislature for Revelstoke, uh, at that time was the Minister of Public Works for BC, and he announced that $150,000 had been allocated for the construction of the highway west of Revelstoke. And they were calling tenders right away. So that was 1920. They completed that highway in 1922. Also in 1920, a Revelstoke Automobile Club was formed with 15 founding members. They had uh, the chief of police, Pratt, the local chief of police, and a provincial constable named Meade who were present and they explained the city and provincial rules of the road uh, and associated penalties. Uh, they, uh, they, they were, at that time, there was no speed limit in the city boundaries. So they were talking about uh, what an appropriate speed limit was, would be. I'm not sure when that act was eventually fixed and what it was, uh, but they did decide that their, that their club colors would be blue and gold. Um, and also in 1920, there's lots of lists of people in town who are buying cars. There was a man named uh, uh, Kenny McRae who had a um, uh, men's clothing store, um, shoe store, but he also was selling cars as well. Um, so he was uh, selling McLaughlin cars to Mayor Buse and a couple of other people. He sold baby grand Chevrolets to Dave Calder and W.A. Sturdy, and Chevrolet is to C.R. McDonald, who was a local druggist, and um, a couple of other people. And um, so there were quite a lot of cars being brought into the town at that time. In um, June of 1920, there was a note in the paper saying that uh, rules of the road in the province would change effective July 15th. And they were very confusing because uh, there, there were two traffic districts in the province. So traffic district one was keep to the left and traffic district two was keep to the right. So you had to know what traffic district you were in. Uh, traffic district one included Vancouver Island and a small part of the mainland extending south to the US border and east of Hope and Yale and all the remaining part of the province was in uh, traffic district two. So it wasn't until 1922 that they uh, got their act together and had left-hand drive in the whole province. 
So uh, you would have had to be pretty careful in 1920 to figure out what part of the province you were in and which rules applied. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure where the crossover was and how that worked. <laughs> Somebody was suggesting if they should have been around about there in 1920. Um, so in uh, 19, as I said, in 1920, they were really uh, starting gearing up work on the West Road. And that continued right up until uh, 1922. In December of uh, 1920, it mentioned that one of the biggest shots that was ever fired in the interior of BC uh, was used on December 15, 1920, to displace 8,000 tons of rock at Victor Lake, 13 miles west of Revelstoke. That nearly four tons of black powder were used for the blast. So the wash pulling down some 10 feet of uh, the wash pulled down some 10 feet of gravel onto the roadbed. And uh, they were planning a second blast uh, in a few weeks after that. At that time, they were trying to get the road built as far as Three Valley, um, with the uh, but they would still have to do the overhead bridge at Clan William. So in 1922, on uh, August uh, 23rd, they had an opening ceremony for the new West Highway at uh, Malakwa. And at that time, the highway uh, was completed as far as Sycamore, but there was also uh, connecting highways to uh, the Kamloops and to the, the coast at that time too. So people could drive all the way through the coast. The roads weren't great. You know, they would have been probably a single lane in a lot of areas and gravel, but there were roads. So uh, finally people could, uh, could travel through. At the, the ceremony, it said there were two witnesses to the driving of the last bike in 1885. Tom Wilson, who discovered uh, Lake Louise, or discovered Lake Louise, or was credited with uh, naming it anyway, and uh, a man named Pat Gallagher of Nelson. They had uh, more than 100 autos at the opening, including 40 from Revelstoke, the rest from Okanagan, and uh, more than 800 people. So they were, uh, that's an average of eight person per car. Um, but they, they had a, a good weather for um, the uh, opening. So following the speeches, the formal declaration of the opening of the road was made by the procession of autos led by the Premier and Minister of Public Works, passing through a cedar arch. And you can see the cedar arch in the photograph here. Uh, which marked the division of the road east to Revelstoke and west of the Okanagan. Uh, a lot of the people returned to Revelstoke for a reception and a dance at the drill hall, and a dinner at the Scandinavian hall was held in shift. They fed 600 people, 100 at a time. Um, so th there was a description of the trip to Malacqua, that no one of the nearly 200 citizens occupying the 40 cars who motored to Malacqua will ever forget the magnificent trip. Had the arrangements for weather conditions been made to order, they could not have been better. The atmosphere was wonderfully clear with no smoke or dust to mar the pleasure of the 34 mile trip. All along the route, the scene was ever changing. The lakes looked inviting, glittering in the sunlight, while Cave's Falls were pronounced by everyone a wonderful sight. Even in the mountainous section of BC, where more or less of this kind of thing can be seen at any time. And Cave's Falls were named after Kay Alexander, who was a former World War I uh, captain. And uh, he was one of the, the contractors um, on, in charge of the work. Uh, there's a note um, in um, a little later in September saying that the LeBeau family from and the Ericsons from Melaqua had made the run from Melaqua to Revelstoke in an incredibly fast two hours and five minutes. Uh, but uh, so the sad thing, of course, is that um, the within a month after the opening of the West Highway, there was the first fatality and the first uh, car into Summit Lake. Uh, and uh, the first unrecovered body in Summit Lake. 
It was uh, happened on September 2nd of 1922, the party of six driven by uh, Donald Adams, and they were heading for the Okanagan to spend Labor Day when their car went over the embankment into Summit Lake. It said uh, the party had proceeded along the old abandoned CPR right of way to a point nearly at the end of the lake when in turning out to pass a car driven by Mr. Shotton, fish, fisheries overseer of Kamloops, the turnout was made somewhat wide, which brought them pretty near the bank, the latter giving way under the weight of the car, allowing it to slide gradually into the water. The bank at that point is about seven feet high and the depth of the lake is said to be about 40 feet at the place where the car entered the water. In the front seat of the car were Mr. Donald Adams, Miss Steed, his fiance, and Wilmot Steed, her, her brother, and in the back, Mr. and Mrs. Steed and Miss Lister. The car itself immediately sank, carrying with it the bodies of the two unfortunate women. Uh, Mr. Shotton, the other driver, and his son went immediately to the rescue and assisted the four to safety, while the son dived several times in the hopes of finding those who had gone down. They um, were able to recover the body of uh, Mrs. Steed, but uh, they never did find the body of, of Miss Lister. So Mrs. Steed was the, uh, the mother of, uh, of, uh, of Lida Steed, who was, and it was her future son-in-law who was driving the car. Um, she was uh, 50 years old, native of Ontario. And um, Miss Lister, who died, was uh, about 28 years of age. And uh, she was the matron of the Queen Victoria Hospital. So it was a real tragedy for the community as, as well. Uh, so this is a picture of a car at uh, Three Valley uh, around the 1930s. And that's the road at Summit Lake, April 14th, 1935. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, most of these roads could not stay open in the winter. Uh, sometimes it was fairly late in the season before they were able to open them. Uh, 1935 was a particularly bad snow year. There were several major slides, um, railway and um, slides. There was um, a Department of National Defense uh, sort of relief men's relief camp at Clan William that was hit by a slide that year and uh, uh, men died in, in that event. So 1935 was definitely a bad, a bad winter. Uh, there's a picture of Victor Lake, west of Revelstoke. So you can see the, you know, the roads were, for the, for the, those, stat, those years, you know, that was what people expected uh, their roads to look like, but uh, certainly what we'd consider to be very scary, narrow, uh, treacherous roads nowadays. Uh, this was the Rutherford's, um, uh, Jock Rutherford Chevron Station at uh, Three Valley. And uh, that's um, near, the west, near the west end of Three Valley. We're sort of right at the bottom of the hill. There's a little pull out there now called Rutherford Beach. Uh, the Three Valley is down at, uh, Three Valley Gap is down at that end of the lake. This is, um, some of the members of the McCarty family and the Dickey family on the uh, bridge, the wooden bridge around 1919. And again, you can see it's a right-hand drive vehicle. Um, so I talked about how most people would put their cars away for the winter. Uh, the local doctor, uh, Dr. Strong, came up with a way to be able to get around and see his patients in the winter and he had this little uh, sort of snow mobile, snow automobile with uh, ski tr uh, skis on the front and uh, tracks in the back. Uh, this photograph would have been taken around 1935 based on uh, what's in the buildings on, on that side. This is the corner of uh, Mackenzie and First. You could you could buy them built like that from Ford Motor Company. Okay, so you could buy the kit to uh, for the tracks. So in um, September of uh, 1919, the Prince of Wales uh, visited here uh, to uh, plant a post on Mount Revelstoke, and he also 
uh, unveiled um, plaque to the First World War uh, fatalities at the courthouse. And there was quite a procession of cars. People were assigned cars to take different members of the, the royal party and the other dignitaries up the, the mountain as far as they were able to get to at that time. Uh, and this is when he was uh, met at the, uh, at the station. Uh, there's the Prince of Wales is there and Mayor Hector McKinnon is next to him there. They were at the station. So uh, yeah, they used a lot of the vehicles in town and sort of assigned people to, to vehicles to get people up the mountain for events like that. Uh, the uh, mountain to the summit of Mount Revelstoke wasn't completed until 1927 but had been under construction since 1912. And uh, so people would travel up the, the, uh, the road as far as they were able to get before 1927. And this, the entrance at that time was on the Big Bend uh, Road, <coughs> uh, which wasn't uh, built all the way around the Big Bend at that time, but uh, there was, a road partway up the Big Bend. And uh, that was where the, the road to the mountain turned off from. This is um, Hector and Delia McKinnon and their family on Mount Revelstoke Road. And I'm thinking this was probably prior to the opening in 1927. It is a right-hand uh, drive vehicle as well. And that was, um, Hector McKinnon was the mayor of Revelstoke for several years. Uh, this is uh, Robert and Jesse Lawton at uh, Ferguson around the 1930s. So not sure what that vehicle is. It's quite a nice one uh, or a year. Any ideas? Any ideas on that one? Possibly a Dodge. So um, talk about in that. Uh, when Cunningham Morris uh, first got his vehicle in 1907, there was a mention of him driving up the canyon as far as five mile. So um, this would be a, approximately where they would have gone. Um, I'm guessing this one was probably taken in 1912. It was uh, based on the, um, the mark on the, photo, on the photograph there. Most of the, those photographs were taken around um, 1912, uh, probably can't see it there, but there's a little sort of copyright mark there. And uh, most of the photographs from that series were taken around 1912. So I'm guessing that's the date of that. Um, but, you know, they couldn't get too, too far up the road at that time. It only went a certain way. This was the Big Bend Road around 1915. <laughs> so rather sketchy. And uh, you can see, look at the, the trestle work in the, um, involved in that. It's like a, a boardwalk. This would have been around 1920. This one came from the Emma Roberts photo album. Uh, so these are the rail and traffic bridges over the Yellow Silhouette River. I was talking about the, the South Road and the, the Loop Road. So about where the Mark Kingsbury pedestrian bridge goes across now. Uh, that's where the railway bridge was, and then there was also a traffic bridge there too. Um, of course, one of the, this is still an active slide path. It's, uh, not that many years ago, there was a slide at Green Slide. This was one in 1936, and I've actually seen uh, government documents from the early 1890s, like 1892, when they were talking about the original. Uh, building of the branch line from Revelstoke, railway branch line from Revelstoke to Arrowhead. It was referred to as Greenslide at that time. So it's been known by that name for many, many years. Um, there was were two ferries that one had to cross uh, to get uh, down that way. Um, the highway was um, completed to Arrowhead in uh, 1923. Uh, it was actually called the Sutherland Highway after um, Dr. Sutherland, who was the Minister of Highways. And um, that included ferries at 12 mile and 24 mile. And then this is a picture showing uh, the road leaving Arrowhead around 19, in 1958. 
and uh, the beaten ferry. So um, from Arrowhead, they would have to ferry boats across to, uh, to Beaton. So um, I talked about um, the Big Bend Highway earlier this year. I did a, a talk on it, so I won't go into that in too much detail. But uh, it was under construction from um, in fits and starts between 1926 and uh, the end of June in 1940, when they finally completed it, it was a you know, huge project. There was a global uh, depression that got in the way of uh, the construction and um, a few other things. But once war was declared in uh, 1939, there was really a push to complete it so that it could be used for transportation of, of convoys. So it was finally completed and opened on June 29th, 1940. Uh, this is the bridge at Bowdoin Encampment, and you can see uh, everybody's favorite wooden head there. Um, that's where he was originally uh, placed after he was carved by uh, Peter Fiocco. And of course, he was later brought down to the junction at uh, Revelstoke and now is in Woodenhead Park near the NW. And uh, so the Big Bend Highway, that was the, the first time that people could get between Revelstoke and Golden by vehicle. Before then, if you managed to uh, drive from the coast or anywhere uh, west of here, if you managed to get to Revelstoke, wanted to continue on, you had to have your vehicle put on the train and sent over to Golden. So it was a big deal when they finally opened the Big Bend Highway. People could drive independently from Revelstoke to, to Golden. But it was a long road following the bend of the highway it was um, never paved. Uh, they couldn't keep it open most of the winter. Um, so, you know, it was still, Revelstoke still remained relatively isolated. This is the McKinnon's uh, shell station at Bowdoin Encampment. Um, so it was um, in the, the um, 1950s, they started construction of the Trans-Canada Highway through Rogers Pass. Uh, this is uh, construction of the, um, the, the bridge at Revelstoke. Um, that might, it was completed in 1961, so this might be prior to 1961. Um, couldn't really get across it at that point. Uh, the, um, but uh, that was, was under construction. We actually have lots of photographs of the construction of the bridge. We had a whole series of slides that were uh, donated recently. So if anybody wants to see in detail how the bridge was built, we've got lots and lots of slides about that. Um, so it was opened on in uh, July of 1961 by Premier W.A.C. Bennett. And they had a, a boy um, helping to open it. And I did know his name, but I don't remember it at the moment, but he was actually visiting family here. He wasn't, didn't grow up here, uh, but this little lad right there is Mike Dragani. And uh, there's probably other people that can recognize some of the other uh, people in the photograph. I think that's uh, Mr. Gallicano right there, Tangri Gallicano. So if anybody else can identify anyone in that photograph, I'd be happy to hear that. And uh, then the um, highway itself was uh, formally opened on September 3rd, 1962. Uh, this is uh, E. Davy Fulton, who is the Minister of Public Works out of Kamloops, and Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. Baker. Uh, this was the second opening of the highway. There had been a, an opening by the provincial government and Premier Bennett uh, at the end of July. There was um, probably more than a little bit of, um, you know, of um, you know, argument over you know, who should have paid for parts of the road. And uh, so Premier Bennett in maybe a little bit of a fit of pique, although they say not, they said that there was practical reasons for it, but they had a separate opening uh, just um, east of the, um, uh, a little bit east of here. And then the formal opening by the prime minister in September. So, you know, that's really not that long ago that that highway has been open. Uh, so it, it, before that, it really, Revelstoke was really quite isolated. Uh, this is um, 
uh, photograph that was taken um, at that on that opening day in 1962. Uh, I've just got a few extra photographs here of some older vehicles. This one was uh, taken in the 1940s. It shows uh, um, Manning's, it's now New Manning's Chinese restaurant, but at that time it was Manning's uh, chocolate uh, factory and uh, ice cream parlor. Um, and but City Hall is there, so it, City Hall was completed in 1939. So that helps us to date that photograph. Uh, this is a hearse. This is the only photograph that I've got that shows this uh, vehicle well uh, in a funeral procession at first in Mackenzie in 1925. A car beautifully decorated for May Day in uh, around in the, around 1920. Uh, you can see there's actually in the little doll at the front of the the car as part of the decoration. And the, the May Queens are in the back of the car. This was the first motorized ambulance around 1920. And a later ambulance written, driven by Joe Farmelo, who I'd mentioned was a, a driver in town. I was surprised to see a black ambulance, you know, it seems. Uh, unusual, unless that was uh, a, a morgue vehicle. I'm not sure about that. I really don't have any information on the vehicle itself. It does look like it's, yeah, it does look like it was taken at the station. You can see the uh, the border of the, at the station there. Uh, this was the uh, first regular bus service to Kelowna in uh, 1931. And the 1924 Bickle International Fire Engine at the Fire Hall, which was the back end of what's now City Hall. Um, and uh, there's, um, I'll tell this story another time. I think I've told it before. There's a very, very funny story about um, when they were uh, taking the, um, the fire engine out for its first uh, its practice run. Uh, it involved a, a, bro a brothel and a very angry madam at, uh, oh, maybe I'll tell that one at our Christmas talk. Um, this is the uh, CPR superintendent's track car that was uh, specially made to uh, ride on the track. This is the Rutherford Motors uh, showroom and service station, uh, probably around the 1950s. So this is what's now uh, the cabin bowling alley. And uh, that curved building there was actually built for the uh, car showroom. And they had a service station there as well. And then they turned that into the, um, the that showroom area into the um, bowling alley in 1962. Uh, this is the hub garage, which is right across the street from where we are right now at the corner of First and Boyle, where the Grizzly uh, pub is now. Uh, this was. Um, Golden Spike Days Parade. So it's an older vehicle that was sort of dressed, decorated for the parade, probably around 1950. Uh, I really like that sort of uh, Art Deco style of the, uh, the garage there, which is the, the name. Uh, this was, um, I've only ever seen a couple of photographs of this and you look at the snow piles on that one. This was a little uh, station that was uh, at uh, Garden and Government Road. And Government Road no longer exists, but it was a, um, an angled road that uh, started from where Lodco Auto Parts is now and angled through right to, originally right through, uh, third, uh, right through to Third Street. Uh, but it created these little triangles of land where you'd find, you know, and that's uh, where that uh, station was located. Uh, you can see the building right there, that's Mountain View School or well, originally built as Revelstoke uh, High School. That's now where the distillery and old school eatery is located. Uh, this um, is a photograph that I really like. It took us a while to figure out uh, where this was, but this is actually the construction of the service station at the corner of First and Campbell where the corner of Home Hardware building is now just up the street from us. Um, so this is this is Campbell Avenue right here, 
And all of these buildings are coal sheds and storage buildings that were built on the other side of a railway track that runs there uh, that used to run right to the end of Campbell Avenue and actually beyond where the end of the avenue is now. So that, that was a fun photograph. We had to take that one out for a few walks to try to finally figure out where it was. And then looking through the newspapers, we actually were able to date it within, within a month. So this was the summer of 1936 when um, Anselmo Pratolini was building the service station. And uh, there's the completed station there. And that's uh, fronting on First Street. So there was a lot more service stations. I only put, brought in a few uh, pictures for the talk today. Um, so thanks uh, for coming today. Just a reminder uh, for our digital audience that we certainly appreciate any donations to the museum. And uh, you can call the museum to make a donation or click the donate now button on our website, revelstokemuseum.ca. Our next Brown Bag History Talk is Wednesday, December 2nd. Uh, it's going to be about A.O. Wheeler and the Selkirk Range. And uh, Wheeler did a um, Dominion topographical survey of the Selkirk Range in the early 1900s and produced what I would call probably the most interesting government report ever written in uh, 1905, a book called The Selkirk Range with accompanying maps. Um, so and there's some really incredible stories in the book of some of what they were doing, uh, doing the survey. So we'll be talking about that next time. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, hope you enjoyed today's talk and I'll see you in a couple of weeks.